So we'll open with the survey question while people file in. If you're if you're a CISO and you're giving a talk called like how to be CISO, is it a bad idea to invite your entire management team? <laughs> so I, it's a good thing I took really good notes in Ed's talk about how to apply for jobs, hiring, or reaching out. Only you're talking about that you don't get paid enough. Yeah, things you shouldn't say in a conference like that. <laughs> okay, I think we will jump into it. Welcome to CactusCon 11 and to our talk about who wants to be a CISO. Obviously, game show themed a little bit there. Uh, I'm Mike Manrod, my good friend. I'm Andy Jordan. And uh, we've got some of our social media and such up there, but it's a little bleached, but uh, we're not hard to find either of us. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Andy Jordan. I started a cybersecurity company called New Genesis Solutions. Um, and before that, I've got about 15 years of cybersecurity experience, and I've always been on the services side of security. So I like doing all of that stuff as part of a, a service for other clients. Awesome, and Mike Manrod lead the security team in CISO for uh, Grand Canyon Education, kind of by proxy of that GCU. So, uh, pleasure to know several of you in that room through that, in this room through that and other capacities. And, um, you know, one thing, one thing several of us who are friends and have interacted a lot in the room have talked about is, one, there's a lot of talented people who don't necessarily make it into the seats where a lot of the decision making get made, so there's an there's an opportunity to improve that pipeline, and 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 two, there's a lot of people who land jobs in a CISO role that uh, sometimes uh, sometimes struggle to thrive there. So with that, we will take that to the so we've kind of tailored this whole presentation into two sides. One, how do you find a job as a CISO, and the second one. How do you keep a job as a CISO? Because those are kind of two separate levels. And so we started coming up with this idea last year when I was at CactusCon. And so uh, New Genesis Solutions is a sponsor for CactusCon. Um, and so just sitting at the booth, there was a lot of people that would come up and say, hey, I want to be a CISO. And these were people coming out of college or starting their careers. And, and they just wanted information. Of, like, I would love to do uh, to be a CISO. And of course, you start asking the questions around, uh, well, what does that mean? What type of CISO do you want to be? Where do you want to get through that? And, and questions would come on both sides of that because ultimately, in my experience, there is no one path to CISO. And so these are some of the things that we're going to work through as, as we kind of talk through it. First phase, again, is going to be working through and launching your CISO career. Um, so what skills do you need to develop? The different types of CISOs that there are because there is no one CISO. Uh, I am a CISO. Mike is a CISO. There are plenty of CISOs here in the room. We are all very different, but we're all effective at what we're doing, and so kind of what makes us that way. Um, and then, of course, there are some career paths that can lead you that way, short hint, a lot. Uh, as we get into the second side of that, how do you really succeed once you're in there? So as you're working through your career, um, you are gonna get all kinds of opportunities to uh, assess programs, create your strategies, and work through those components. But ultimately, as part of building out your strategy, you're going to need to build out a team, um, which includes people, your tools, and even your internal organization itself. Um, you're going to need to build all that together. So that's the why for our presentation, is really becoming a CISO. So what is a CISO? Right? We get this term a lot. So let's just cover some of the basics. Chief Information Security Art, uh, Officer. Um, there's a couple of different roles this would be in an organization. It doesn't actually have to be CISO. It could be uh, VP of Security. Uh, it could be Manager or Director of Security within smaller organizations. But basically, we're talking about the senior most person within an organization that is responsible for, in, in a more typical sense, uh, being the technical person that helps look at risks of the organization. Uh, responsibilities are going to be varied, right? So as we look at small organizations, your security team um, is going to be maybe just you and maybe one or two other analysts. In larger organizations, you're going to be, especially global or enterprise, 
you're going to be the CISO that is looking to uh, establish the architecture or strategy for the organization, and then you would have senior engineers or architects supporting you as part of that. Uh, and so ultimately, the scope of responsibility for a CISO is going to be very different across the board. Hopefully I covered the point. <laughs> yeah. It's you, you. You kind of get a pass because half the room probably can't read them either, so everybody's speculating uh, what you're saying. So, who in the room can remember a time, maybe when you were younger, where like bigger is better, right? Like, you know, you always want the fastest car. If there's a truck, a bigger truck, and if somebody's like, "Hey, do you want to be a CISO at a big company or a small company?" You know, the answer, of course, no brainer. If you're like ten, is of course bigger. And then biggest is even better. Um, it's a common mistake, right? And I've seen, and you know, this ties in well with a lot of Ed's points earlier. You know, a lot of us in the room have seen a lot of people land in jobs and then spend a short time there and move on to other jobs because they went for the biggest they could get, but not what they actually wanted. So one of the things to think about is what you like doing. Um, and there's no right or wrong. There's a tendency to get into stigmas about, well, this doing this type of thing is better than doing that type of thing. Look at it instead from the lens of what you genuinely enjoy and are fulfilled doing. And then begin to build whether, and this applies whether you're looking at the broader cybersecurity landscape or it applies as it relates to being a CISO, right? So, you want to think about, do you want to be serving a massive org or do you want to be serving a small org? Well, that depends. Do you want to be strategic, managing people who manage people who are technical? Do you want to be very administrative, organizational, exact, lots of meetings, lots of high profile presentations, lots of finance and strategy? Well, they go big. Do you want to stay technical and keep your hands in the weeds and do lots of really fun configuration or have the ability to have a technical track while also being a CISO, well then maybe you want to go smaller or go and go for a role where uh, where you have uh, more, more, more freedom of operation and more things to work on because it's actually a smaller org, so you get to do more. So, um, you know, Andy's going to get a little further into this. Org structures of a cybersecurity org vary a lot, and what makes them effective vary a lot. This is an image from here that I know you can't read. Maybe you couldn't read it on a good projector, but I know you can't read it on this one. So I should just make things up. So this is Snoopy, this is Charlie Brown, this is Lucy, there's the football. No, but all joking aside, um, you can see that if you're the CISO of this large org, um, if something's going on in forensics and malware analysis down here, and decisions are being made, those are going to roll up to you in a meeting with the person who manages the person who manages the person who came up with the strategy. You'll get one hour for Q&A, and you'll get rushed off to another meeting. That's actually, again, there's no good and bad. If you want to be involved in a lot of things and able to direct a lot of resources, maybe for special projects, research, that might be what you want. But if you want to be able to jump in there and open open IDA and analyze the malware sample everybody is talking about and have a little time to do that, then maybe a smaller org or a SLED organization or a medium org is for you. Um, I'm not going to get into functional areas. I think we're going to touch on that later. But a simple way to think of this is, you know, if they have an effective security org, the functions need to be there whether you're small or large. You have to have controls that allow you to stop attacks from adversaries. Looks like we have somebody trying to get in in the back. Feel free to file in and cram in however you fit. It must have been something I said. <laughs> no. um, but but in, in any case, what, what you end up with is the function of stopping bad things from getting in, which often involves some architecture, engineering, and control and administrative functions. Once, what do you think you have once you have a bunch of tools showing you things? You deploy some tools, you have some controls. What do you think happens? What do you do when a light flashes on your dashboard driving down the freeway? Mm -hmm. Drops paper over. 
This is a conducting <laughs> rubric. That is actually a very skilled mechanic. So that, I don't know. I don't know whether to be delighted or scared at that answer. If I follow Ed on the way out of here, drive it like 50 feet behind just in case something falls off. No, but you res you end up with alarms from those tools and things you have to respond to, right? So then you end up with a triage and a response process and even investigations and forensics. And then as you mature along, one way I like to think of it is, imagine, imagine this is creating, uh, you, you're, you're protecting a Super Bowl party from bees. And imagine Andy's the strategist here and leading this. First he hands out fly swatters to swap bees. And then he hands out some flamethrowers, some better tools, some alarm systems, maybe some spotters to see if bees come along. But now imagine he has a bad vest that shows up every time with a beehive and just spikes it into the ground. How effective will you be? Well, the final frontier ends up being governance, risk, compliance, and having an overall mature work. So that's kind of your org chart, chart, whether it's three people or whether it's lots more than that will reflect those basic functions. So let, let's first start this. We've got typically four types of skill sets within cybersecurity. Um, three a little bit. We'll go through, a lot of people are starting today in blue team. You know, you get a lot of SOC analyst positions. You also have a lot of red team to where pen testing will always be sexy. We'll always <coughs> get news articles, will always be amazing. And there is avenues to take that. And then of course, the least attractive guy in the whole bunch is our risk and GRC <laughs> So sorry, you take third place forever. It's um, okay, Sam, you can throw things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and ultimately you get, you know, the other fourth one, which is often not understood, but you get other lateral moves from an executive that moves over to oversee a program, but didn't start within security itself. And those are the four types of CISOs that you're probably going to see from a background perspective. Um, within uh, the blue team, both Mike and I came from the blue team. Now, I started in mostly vulnerability and threat uh, management across the board and building all of those things out. And then over time, just really developed that specific discipline. Mike came from a security admin to engineering to architecture to CISO, right? So there's no great difference. I've seen pen testers be amazing CISOs. I've seen GRC people be amazing CISOs. So I, I want to dispel one myth in here that there is a consistent pathway to go there's not. There really is how much you really spend in terms of understanding all of these different disciplines as Mike talked about through the org structure and then being able to understand the process between them and then for the organization that you're supporting. And that's really gonna be that one piece. So if you love blue team stuff and you're like, I really enjoy looking at PCAT files and I really being, uh, love being able to look at forensic data there's absolutely value for that in a multiple different you know, arenas, and there are companies that look for that type of background specifically you know, that you're gonna find. And so ultimately, your skill set is amazing today. You just need to continue to refine that, and you will find your way there. There's not a pathway to see so that you've missed the boat. And I think that's the one thing that I want to make sure, you know, as we talk through this slide, and as you go home and apply it, I don't want you to feel like it's five years in the future. It might be, but you are, there are things that you're doing today that are your foundation today. Yeah, definitely. So as we look into this, there are a lot of different CISOs today. There are CISOs today that don't have the title of CISO. And why, and why is that? It's because ultimately there's a couple of different things. There are security managers or directors that honestly are looking over the IT group or supporting from within IT, but may not have the responsibility to reach out to their peers within HR and marketing and operations and some of those other aspects. They are supporting IT systems as part of their uh, kind of uh, support model within the environment. There are uh, CISOs as you get into that that are a true executive that do have that conversation with those other departments within an organization. Uh, and this is okay. Now, ultimately, we as CISOs, our goal is to get outside of IT as fast as possible. And the reason for that is we want to be able to support the business itself as it's performing its operation. So, I want to start talking to the marketing guys 
in terms of understanding their next, you know, kind of social media campaign and which piece of software they're buying, buying from the cloud that I didn't know about. Because all of a sudden that becomes a new phishing uh, adventure or some other type of thing where someone goes, forget your password and now I need to go chase that down from phishing. I want to understand HR from you know, all these people coming in from a job perspective. I want to meet with the business. And this is where we as CISOs are really focusing our time as quick as we can to get out of IT in order to kind of support the org and not just IT. Now, CISO as a corporate officer, you are gonna see some of these um, areas, um, and this is gonna be for your Fortune 100s, uh, but ultimately there are some pieces uh, specifically for how a CISO would be outside of answering to IT as a whole, and I know there's a whole conversation around should a CISO report into the IT manager from a conflict and from a duty perspective. In this role, you're gonna see a CISO reporting straight to the CEO or the board of directors. I'll, I'll give you a small hint, it's rare, right? And, and I realize everyone's like, oh yeah, we should have full autonomy and authority. I agree, let's work with what we have where we are. And so if you are in a smaller organization, this is probably the pathway that you're gonna start with. As you level up the organization, you're gonna move into that meeting with people outside of IT, and then for, again, the, that big uh, organization, that's where you are. Well, I'll ask it to dovetail and Andy let us right there. What do you all think? Let's let's do a thought experiment. Say you're working for, you know, Fortune 500 company, big enough where it could go either way, but small enough where it could go either way. You're given the CISO title, and you have the option of being a corporate officer or not, and say it doesn't affect your pay or anything else, say they're the same. Which do you want and why? What do you all think? Who, who would want to be the corporate officer? <coughs> who would not want to be the corporate officer? Yeah, it, it seems cool until you look at the fact that now you're on a restricted trading list, you're in a whole bunch of meetings that have nothing to do with security, that actually distract you from security. But again, which is right, which is wrong, it depends. If you're running a, if you're running a company that has 30 different security divisions across three continents, maybe that is what you want. But it's not always what you want. Go ahead. So, quick question. You can take this offline if you need, but I would be really <clears throat> interested to understand your perspective from a, the way CISO, the CISO role is evolving, not just as the classic scapegoat and the breach occurs, <laughs> but also as the potential jail executive, so to speak, or fined executive when a breach occurs because of the responsibility of the role. And, and does it make more sense to be a corporate officer because now you get, you get a different level of bailing and errors and omissions, director, and this is all stuff that, you know, again, whiskey and beer as needed, you know. Go ahead, and then I'll hang on. We continue to see situations like Uber progressing where the CISO gets pulled in as part of that breach. And, and, and I think there's a lot of fear around, I don't want to go to jail because someone else messed up. Um, our goal, the, the one of the core things that a CISO needs to be able to do is communicate risk to the organization and allow the business to, to answer for that risk. And so if you are not communicating that risk and trying to bury it or not giving the business the opportunity to own its own risk as the CISO being the risk custodian, then, then you're doing a disservice to the business. Right. Um, and, and I think as long as we can kind of keep that in balance, like, there's only so much that I can do when, the, let's just talk about size of organization. A CISO in any organization will have a smaller group of people than the IT organization, and definitely a smaller organization from operations to the business. So if we're gonna run a numbers game on trying to manage all the herding of kittens, like you're gonna have a bad time unless you understand that my job is to communicate risk and let the business own that risk. Now, situations like Uber, are becoming more prevalent uh, to where the CISO is actually held legally responsible and has taken the court uh, for actions according to some of those things. Uh, that will continue to occur. That will become more and more, especially as we're starting to get into higher regulations like GDPR, the California Consumer Protection Act, all the rising of other uh, privacy actions. There's now a China privacy law that becomes really problematic for your enterprise organizations that need to manage a SOC but want to bring in that data, but you can't do that because that's 
now weird things. Um, and so all of these types of challenges, you know, I, I also want us to think about that in your, if you are in those circumstances, you now have to think as a global CEO that deals with individual country laws, not just, you know, in your geographic central area. And so there is some complexity around that. Um, I, I think the core piece for it is, again, allowing the business to own its own risk. The, the CISO does not own risk, nor should it ever. Yeah, and as that accountability shifts, you know, Ed, you're right, it's definitely a risky conversation. Um, yeah, since, since it's a two-way conversation, maybe we can get Andy to buy the whiskey. Yeah. Uh, no, um, but all, all joking aside on that, um, it's going to be tough. Like, I almost feel like some of us should be pushing back on some of the legislation because if we make it so such an impossibly difficult and risky job to be a CISO relative to even other executive roles, it's going to just make it harder to find good ones. Um, so it, it's a good question. Uh, so, do you want to be technical? Do you like getting your hands dirty? Do you like being able to see the data? Is this something fun to do? You probably want to find a smaller organization in order to be a CISO. If you don't, and you're like, uh, you know, I'm living through the data, I've done that for the past 15 years, I'm tired of looking through PCAT files, that's okay too. These are not, one is better than the other type of role. You can be a technical CISO. There are some components to this that let's, let's kind of make it, you know, let's, let's use some classifiers here. When I say you don't need to be a technical CISO, that does not mean that you don't need to know how antivirus works or you don't need to know what a SIM is, or these other foundational controls around it. What we're trying to say is, on a technical level, do you need to go hands-on keyboard in order to help support the execution of security operations, engineering, your business intelligence and aggregation of reports, or even just GRC components? There are a lot of CISOs that, because it's really hard to do GRC, end up running your own uh, kind of assessments, that end up meeting with auditors, that end up being that person that helps capture that. And so that's how they structure their org and understanding the skills that they have to play with as their overarching team. But there's no like, ah, oh, CISO should be technical. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And I think it's about finding the size of organization that you feel most successful in supporting. And that's, those are the ones that you want to look at. So if you enjoy being technical, find the smaller companies. You're going to have a great time. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're still paid well. Let, let's classify well. You are definitely in a six-figure salary, right? This is a six-figure salary type of conversation here. If you are not making that, uh, I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> oh, six-figure here in the U.S. Maybe, the, maybe that's a classifier. Yeah, that is a good classifier, actually. Yeah, so uh, I, I, think, I think you're spot on. And then the, the one other thing I'll add is, it may evolve with the role, right? Like if you yeah. if you start in a CISO role with three three people with an organization and you spend ten years there, you might become more strategic and less technical as time goes on to evolve to the changing needs of that work. Um, I mean, hopefully, if everything goes well within a corporation, hopefully some small companies become big companies. Um, a day in the life of a CISO. This is. This is a fun one. Like, uh, there's a couple people that I know in the room that have known me long enough to have heard me say this even before, like way back in the day. But some types of leadership are not a nine to five role, they're a five to nine role. Um, you know, CISO is one of those jobs. Now that doesn't mean you can't mature it to a place of such efficiency and effectiveness that you have balance. But it's definitely not a, well, it's five every day, you're out, it's done. In general, cyber is often not one of those roles. Like it's just not one of those career fields. It's more fun, it's more rewarding, we get to do exciting work, it's flexible. You know, we can you know, a lot of us have some of our most successful meetings at events like the Phoenix Open, wandering around and chatting. That's not the kind of thing you see in a lot of other lines of work. But that comes with the cost of you know having meetings for anywhere between you know, six to 12 hours a day, depending on the role, and then you take a dinner break and there's some emails, and again, eventually you can build structure up to make that more manageable, but at least your first couple of years in a CISO role, expect it to be a little crazy. 
The other is, you know, expect both extremes. Expect to have fun, go, come to stuff like this, uh, but also expect to get a call and like run off abruptly and then not go home for weeks and like stay in a hotel. Uh, handling things like the closest hotel to where you work and cater food. You know? so, so expect, it's definitely one of those jobs where both things will happen. Of course, you can keep in keep in mind that the type of work you select will also bound the craziness. You can get an org that will have a little less craziness and more stability, or you can pick roles that will bring a lot of craziness, but sometimes they're really rewarding too. Um, so again, we touched on this, but just to kind of land the plane on this topic, uh, and I know this is pretty washed out. I, I have to read it from the screen, so I guess that says something, but. The, you know, the main thing to, to be aware of is begin to think about both in a CISO role you go for, as well as the career path leading up to it, think about what you enjoy doing. Thinking about, think about what experiences you have that you can build upon, too. So if you're five years into a blue teaming career or a red teaming career, and you're really, really good at that, well, you can build a path from there um, you don't, you know, kind of to what Andy was saying, you can frame your career path around what you're good at, what you have experience with, what you like, what comes naturally to you. And then also, the one other thing is, keep in mind what you hate doing, right? Like, there are, we all have those tasks we don't like, those things that, you know, I put the, what makes your skin crawl, that might be overdoing it, but who here has seen The Incredibles, the movie? You know, you saw that one where Mr. Incredible was the insurance claim adjuster. And like, that's an example of that's a bad job for them. Somebody has to adjust insurance claims. The insurance industry would screech to a halt. There are people who are a good fit for that job. They're analytical. They don't get too emotionally attached to each case or whatever that job profile is. I'm not in insurance, but there's somebody who's right for that. But clearly that character was not right for that job. And it was obvious. So figure out what you don't like doing and what you like doing, and build both your career and your path to and within CISO around that. So I like to think of these phases in analyzing job postings. I get the question a lot, like, what, what is this job posting? I mean, even within the past week, what is this job posting? What's this type of engineer? It says engineer, but then it asks for this. One of the main things you want to do is first obviously start with a dream of where you want to go, but then read the postings for that for the jobs that lead along that path, align it to the skills you have, and then build build scaffolding to elevate the gaps and also carve a path that leverages and aligns. And Ed gave us some great tips earlier and some more tomorrow about how to fit your resume to that. Um, but Again, you don't have to bridge all the gaps because, let's face it, most job postings ask for impossible things. But if you begin to frame a good portion of it, you're, you can probably get there. Um, and then lastly, you all don't need to hear this because you're here. But network, connect, get to know people, stay for the happy hour. And you're like, wow, I really like what Ed said. Or, gosh, I heard Lester does some really cool stuff and I saw him talk at this thing and I like his ideas. Go up, talk to people converse, get to know people, um, because it will set you apart, maybe not in one conference, but if you do that over time, it will set you apart from this huge stack of resumes that all look alike. <clears throat> the only thing that I think I would add is just a re-emphasis on the networking component. The people that you are meeting now, you will probably continue to meet with. The people that come to this conference next year are probably the same people that will come next year. And so kind of as, as meeting with people, despite how much we might change positions every three years, we're all gonna be working together. This is a close-knit community. Relationships really have made a difference in, in my own career, as well as I can guarantee Mike's career and, and all of us as well as we start moving through. I haven't had to use my resume in a long time because it's the people that I know. It, it, it just gets me through the, the HR firewall, and then once I'm there, I'm already talking to people because I have a relationship with them. And this is how jobs are today, uh, especially at an executive level. Definitely.
So now we get into the fun transition point of, okay, so before we actually get into uh, how to keep your job as a CISO, because we've all seen there's a lot of churn, getting there is one thing, staying there is another, and <laughs> yeah, that says drink more. That's really <laughs> just, <laughs> just drink tea. Oh, drink, yeah, switch to tea from coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think maybe I'm already biased towards the, uh, having whiskey, but I had a half on happy hour with both, with both ends. No, but before we transition into how to keep the job once you get it, you all have questions on the career path of the road from you know, the many roads that lead to CISO. Like, we'll pause and do two or three minutes here. Go ahead. So, do you want to touch at all on, uh, as you're looking for the job, is there uh, opportunity to examine the type of environment that you may be trying to take on the role in? And what sort of aspects come into that? So it's not just, hey, I want to go, I want to go be a CISO at a SaaS company, or I want to go be a CISO at a municipality. But you, what other sort of things would you recommend somebody who's on that path take a look at? It? And I'll preload it. Things like culture. What other things beyond that would you would you recommend a uh, person take a look at? Yeah. So I'll say one thing. Part of that question is answered with the second half, because as the CISO, your job is to actually create the place everybody else doesn't, everybody else wants to work. So if you interview for a place and it doesn't meet, they like it's horribly misaligned with the rest of this, you might not want to go there unless when you meet with the executive in charge, like say a CIO or CTO or executive leader, if they're like, hey, I know it's a mess and I want you to fix it, that might actually be okay. Yep. But yeah, I agree, Ed, you want to consider where you're going. You also want to consider the vertical as you build, build your career path. Like, for me, having spent most of my career in SLED, a transition to banking might be a little clunky and awkward. It's not that I couldn't do it, but if I woke up one day and said, oh, I want to be a banking CISO, I could do that, but I would need to expect that to be a little more difficult than if I wanted to, say, transition to something more adjacent. So think about your verticals, and again, if you're several years into your career looking to make that jump from, say, lead architect or engineer to CISO, um, at that point where you've got a lot of experience, definitely leverage and build upon versus trying to go from like, hey, I've been an engineer in K through 12 and education my whole life, and now I'm gonna go into automotive manufacturing assembly CISO. What do you got, Andy? I think there are two things that I would look for if I were having a conversation with a, a CEO. Again, the question premise is that you're looking for a new job, not that you've elevated your career. But these are the two things that I would look for to make sure that I'm going to be successful as a CISO. The first one is appetite to change. A CISO is going to come in with new practices, processes, and other elements. And if you get a very resistant business, you're going to have a harder time being able to be successful in that role because you're the only one continuing to champion versus that executive partnership. The second thing is, are they willing to back it up with money? What does the budget look like to operate these programs and what is their appetite to actually invest into a program that is able to make a change? Um, and those are two questions that I guarantee every CISO in the room is like, oh my God, please. Um, but, Honestly, that's what I would look for in that kind of uh, whole conversation to make sure that this is an organization that I can be successful in, as well as the industry kind of uh, experience and exposure. We have one other question oh, for you. Yeah, quick question. So before we transition over to keeping uh, your job in the CISO, absolutely. Now that you're you know, on the other side of the sort of chasm between the senior management and being a CISO, what are maybe one or two intangibles that you would see in someone who maybe is ready to make that leap? Um, because I'm pretty sure we make it as we can not really sure until you've done it, but... So, you got so I think the first one to recognize that your peers, the, per the people that you're working with every single day, are not security people. So the more that you are able to interface and communicate effectively with, again, I'll, I'll pick on maybe different groups, uh, let's go with the finance team and legal in order to kind of understand what they want to do. You need to peer with them on, on accomplishments and deliverables that they want to do. So a good way to work with it is how quickly can you communicate with other people, not in information security at all. Uh, as part of that, the practice for it are, are going to be, this sounds horrible, I live my life in PowerPoint. 
I'm not even in Excel anymore. I'm in PowerPoint. So the more you use, ta-da! Uh, the more you understand kind of that visibility and communicating things, like the more you can get that message out there in language that they're going to understand. Like you're you're going to be a little further than than others, um, and I would say that that's a lot of where I'm spending my time is, is working through this and understanding kind of some of the problems that I then need to come up with solutions for. Um, and I know that we pick on this a lot as technical people. Or what you, you often get this whole idea of don't tell me about your problem, tell me about a solution. I'll I'll help you out once you get to a certain level as an executive. You just get that coming back down to you. And so you get this thing coming from the CEO telling you, I, I, you're the solution, I thought you need to fix this problem. And then you get your team coming in going like, I got this problem lost. Um, and so you kind of need to be able to navigate that piece. And, and I would say that would be the other intangible mechanism is being able to understand both of those worlds. Kind of like that. Yeah, and, and related to that, like indicators when you're ready. I love that one of your favorite security tool is PowerPoint. You're probably ready. No, uh, but the, the other, I mean, hopefully that's not your only security tool, but it, it's, a, it's a sign that it's one of them or one of your favorites. One of the other, one of the other things is if you can look at something and instead of seeing like, oh, I can't do that because finance said no. Instead, if when you look at it. You see a range of possibilities and options and opportunities. And I learned this from, I'll, I'll call, call out Dan Schuler for kind of teaching me this way of thinking back when I worked for him back in the day. You know, it really comes down to mapping out and understanding like, hey, if we build this relationship to your relationship building points, if we establish this connection, if we, if we craft this messaging, all of a sudden we will have the budget and the people and the buy-in. So if, you're, if you look at it and you're like, uh, we can't do that, you're probably not ready to be CISO. So if that's okay, don't give up, just keep scaffolding up to it. If you look at it and you're like, yeah, we can do that, well then you're probably ready. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that me or you? Yeah, that's you, I had to squint. We put a little letter so we know what we're doing. All right, they are both uh, bled out and off screen. Yeah. So here's our cheat code in case you're curious when we get confused or like, I don't know who's talking to the slide. It's up to another word today because everything's washed out. One of the first things you'll hear from a CISO is, or you'll want to hear from a CISO is, is what is your strategy? What's your three year plan? And in fact, when you're going to apply for a, a position, your CEO or other members, CFO, are going to ask you what's the three year strategy for the organization, what's, what's typical? And this is what you're going to need uh, within the first 90 days, and then as a long-term strategy moving in there as well. Um, as a CISO, you're going to need to get really comfortable understanding finances, because it's on you to manage the budget for those things in a way that you can effectively achieve. So I have one that I created years ago. Now, I'll, I'll read it for you, and then if you would like to contact me for slides, I have no problem you know, sharing slides and this specific Visio itself. Now, this was a organization, just to kind of give some, some context to it, that is still surviving by people paying for email addresses. Literally, like $15 a month to pay for an email address. That's this business, and they're surviving on only that, but of course they have other things that add value to the business. So let's add that as a weird anecdote. Across the top, there are five different uh, components or areas to focus on. We have asset inventory, infrastructure asset management, security operations, compliance and identity, and security risk management components. And then we start with, as you come in, you're gonna to want to look at the foundational controls, how is asset management being performed, and then as you work into the infrastructure, which layers all these things together, patching and configuration management. Next, as you get into the processes, you'll look at uh, change management, software management, and vulnerability management in that space, and then you can see that in operations we need to figure out security incident response, and then as we get into governance we need an overarching set of policies, um, and then identity and access management, and then risk management as you're in those spaces. And so the way I've stacked this is year one, here's what you're doing, and it stacks into those things that you're looking at a foundation. Year two needs to build on the things that you're doing previously, and year three, you're starting to work at it from there. There is no one single roadmap that's going to support all organizations, but ultimately you do want to try to break it out to say like, in, in achievable chunks, 
Because you can't look at it and say, boss, it's going to take me three years, and you only get to see what we have in three years. You'll be fired. <laughs> so you need to be able to carve up measurable points to where the security program can demonstrate maturity. And so in these things, this is why it kind of builds on top of itself. I would love to see your security roadmaps. This is where I, I feel like within the industry, CISOs don't often get a chance to you know, build off of each other. So this is one of mine. I have no problem sharing it. If you would like to trade yours, I would love to look at it because ultimately, what are the things that we as CISOs might be missing? Because here's the other one, being CISOs lonely, I don't have a lot of resources. And, and you, the you didn't say that before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's talk about drawbacks. Beyond that whole five to nine problem, like, who are you going to talk to? Because it's it's this thing where everybody's just mad at you all the time. So, so roadmaps uh, and other components. This is a good one that builds over uh, three years. Obviously, I have many others because I do this as a service. And so there are some organizations that you know are tailored differently. But I thought this one was good. Yeah, and one funny anecdote as we move through, and I know we started a little late, so we'll move through some of the things kind of quickly. But this roadmap is key. If you forget everything else going into a CISO role, or if you make it into the final interview, I was one of the least qualified candidates for the job I have today. It was six years ago. I've learned a lot since then. And I actually went out to dinner with the founder of another company in the Valley who's a great, great leader, but kind of blunt. And he asked my boss, why did you pick this guy? Uh, so I'm like, hey, thanks a lot. No. But so we're at the lunch and she said he was the only one who showed up with a plan. Because there were, there were like a lot of people who applied and many of them were much more qualified. But I kind of interviewed my CIO in that uh, very first phone interview. I went out to a cigar bar I asked the bartender, should I be nice or should I be brutal? She said, you should just be ruthless. So I made a long PowerPoint of everything that I thought our org should fix and showed up with that PowerPoint, which kind of touched on all the things Andy walked through, and that's what got me the job. So this one will keep simple, but you can't protect what you don't know. Uh, it's still up on the wall when I got into this job. Samantha in the room, our GR, head of GRC, we mapped out the entire process of our org and every system, every data flow on sticky notes. It's like 130 feet long along the wall in our IT area, and then she visioed it. And so that allowed us to understand what we were protecting very early on and build our strategy and prioritize our roadmap. So just visualize what's highest risk, prioritize what you want to fix. And if you go into a CISO role where there are people who already know the problems, leverage that. Don't reinvent the wheel. Ask them what they think needs to be fixed. It's usually right, or at least a huge part of what's right. Um, all right, this is shared, but uh, you are, we're already talking budget, so I'll let you to kick off with this one, Andy. Um. I mentioned it before, financing is a big one of what you're working on. I'll give you a hidden piece. Building relationships with vendors gets a little bit fuzzy. And, and, I'll, and I'll say that because obviously you need to negotiate the best price, but you want to do so in a way that maintains your integrity. Um, and of course that you know kind of is a whole piece because ultimately you need to be able to come in there and drive a program. Um, but you need to do so in a way that's financially achievable. <laughs> and sometimes if you have, can have a good relationship, you can maybe get better deals. Definitely. And that's the contract negotiation picture too. And I think we touched on a couple of these. The main message there is it's not just about security skills at that level. So I'll go through this. You know, this, this touches on the question I'd asked a little bit ago, which is just culture is key, right? Hire the people that are going to create the culture you want to work within. Build the, type, build the type of security team you want to be a part of. And cultivate talent, you know, I mean, I know this is kind of why we're all here, but cultivate talent, invest in people with the values that you think are right for your org. Don't just go out and fight for the same 10 well-known engineers everybody else is fighting for. Um, Make the worst workplace fun and pe put people first. This makes a world of difference. You know, it's got like you want a culture where people are genuinely cared about and cared for, and 
you want your team to care for you because right like you're in this for the long haul it's difficult you all want to support each other so you know we already kind of touched on this but you you don't necessarily always want to report to the ceo it depends on the type of situation it's a common cliche that the CISO should always report to the CEO. Well, it depends. If you're a multinational where there's 40 other divisional heads of security on several continents, you probably do want to report to the CEO. But if you have a great CIO that's going to run interference and empower you, reporting to them could be really advantageous. So in terms of strategy, and we're moving quickly, I understand, I got the eyes. <laughs> uh, keep, keeping a strategy in mind, we mentioned it a couple times, you need to think in terms and using the language of the business in order to be effective at it. And remembering the overall picture of the business is risk. And so the more you have an understanding or to start developing the skills of taking technical risk and understanding it, and then understanding the impacts for enterprise risk, the more effective that you're going to be. The last one is, is, is don't be shy. Uh, we, we, I have no problem walking up here and saying I'm, I'm probably an idiot in a lot of areas. And I'm okay with that. And building the relationships that we have, like there's no one perfect. And, and I'll guarantee for all of us ESOs, nearly every time or every day, we have moments where we're like, we look at it and go, I, I have imposter syndrome. I am lucky to be here. I shouldn't be here. And this is normal. Welcome to being a CISO. We don't know what we're doing, but we kind of do because we've been doing it for 15 years, but our fear is that we don't know what we're doing. And this, this is normal, and, and lean into this and continue to say, I acknowledge that, and, and let's just kind of go to the next one. And, you know, again, these next few will roll together, which is just basically, frameworks are your, are your friend. Actually, that was the wrong direction. Frameworks are your friend, right? And I'm stealing your slide in. Yeah, go ahead. Rolling through fast. Yep. We're, we, we're going to spend a little more time on this, but figure out what frameworks best apply to your situation from understanding the attacker and how to defend and fit those, fit those to your decision. Go ahead. No, no, that's, that's the one. Yeah, yeah there you go. So, so just frameworks are your friend. Put them to work for you. Don't let them dominate you in a checkbox sort of way, but more use them to empower what you want to accomplish. And then, do you want to say a few things on this? And so nope, okay. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> now that's, see, that's really good balance we have here, even. <laughs> no, so I, I, I picked this one because this is the area I struggle, right? So I figure I should pick the slide I'm the worst at. No, but in general, part of this is if you make the culture fun, if it's not bureaucratic, if you make it a fun place to work for everybody else, it's going to be a fun place to work for you too. So that's actually one of the main things here. But just balance, don't burn yourself out. And then um, I think one thing that leads to burnout is churn. So in security roles, we should start thinking longer term. You know, if you've gone like roll to roll every two to three years and you're burned out, well, that actually could be why. And with that, um, Rachel, do we have time for questions or? Yes. Okay. Well, I want to make sure you had time for questions. That's why I was giving you the time warning. Um, so we'll have about eight minutes for questions right now. And I also wanted to do a plug for our next speaker. You both are mentioning risk and what risk means to the business. Risk is also a good path to CIO or CISO. And our next talk is about careers in risk. So quick little plug. Uh, but yeah, just a few minutes left for questions. Sweet. Cool. What questions do you all have? And we'll be at the happy hour too, so you don't get an hour now. Go ahead. I have a question. So, how do you balance the it is what it is, the board owns the risk versus this is my responsibility? How do you balance that out? That's a really great question, Tyler. So, the question for everybody else is how do you balance the responsibility of like, hey, this is my responsibility and the buck stops here versus, hey, this is this is transfer risk to the board or to somebody who said, no, we're going to do this really dumb thing, even though you as the CISO said not to. It's a common challenge. I think part of it comes down to something, you know, uh, Andy and I have talked about a lot and he's a master at, which is risk, properly educating people on risk. 
often when somebody in a leadership role, like a CEO or somebody accepts a risk, they don't really know what risk they're accepting. They don't really understand it. So once they're really made to understand and acknowledge it and then document that they understood it, okay, well then you've done your job. The only thing I'd add in is pen testing. Pen testing is a good way to say like, oh yeah, yeah, this is fine and whatever happened, what's the statistical likelihood of this event impacting the business, likelihood and probability, uh, or likelihood and impact. A pen test demonstrates some of those components. So this is where pen testing is a value point um, and kind of working through that. The other one is, you know, kind of socially working through internal audit or internal finance team or having sidebar meetings with other executives to say like, hey man, I'm really nervous about that. Build, build the relationships in a way to say like, I, I, I gotta talk to John. John, hey, can you talk to Bob over there? Because Mary's having some issues. Like, and, and so leveraging the relationships of that is, is really key. And that's how you last eight years and not two. Definitely. Go ahead, Dan. Um, so, story. I, I did actually think it, it was Wednesday that this week that I had a 5 a.m. meeting with our UK office that we were giving an awareness training on the GDPR uh, issues and regulations. I went next to a meeting with our San Francisco office that had a actually security incident that we were working through. And I wrapped the day with our office in Shanghai at about six o'clock that evening with a, the PIPL, which is their new privacy issue. Anyways, thought of you because it was a five to nine day. And it's, yeah. Um, my question is, <laughs> you mentioned getting away from IT or outside of IT as fast as possible. I 1,000% agree. However, could you guys talk a little about how big of a partner IT is, um, how, how, how critical they are to actually operating a security program? It's great you asked that, and I'll, I'll segue this and punt it to Andy. This is one of those things I think we spent five, six hours on phone calls debating because we, like, we have different opinions scenario by scenario on whether to be in IT, outside of IT, and with that, I'll hand it to you. <laughs> hey, here, this brown paper bag's on fire. I'm just going to hand it to you. Now. <laughs> I skipped over this by saying we want to get outside of IT as much as out, as quickly as possible, but we are never out of IT. That is our domain in terms of applying the best practices to the organization or helping to get those best practices applied. And part of it sometimes is helping the business actually understand what those best practices are in terms of standards and configuration baselines that we can use, pass on, and everything else. That is very difficult. Honestly, I think IT is often in an adversarial relationship on, on occasion in alignment with the goals of security at certain points in time. And it could be just as simple as IT guy going like, I don't have time for all this stuff that you keep giving me. Please give me a prioritized list and I'll help you out. You can have to do it. And that is, that is for a portion of normal. The other thing in terms of advocating for IT, my current stance is, is IT is underspent or undersupported and more budget needs to go into IT because I can't do any of this security stuff because IT doesn't have the ability to make those changes anymore. And so that might be going up to financing and saying like, hey, we need this project because yeah, AD is really old and we need a domain refresh and IT guys need to be able to do it, but you can't context switch incidents because they need to be managing operations to the business. And so how do we get a actual project Maybe we need to go outside of IT and find an IT support partner in order to give them project level support to get there. And again, I'm not trying to get IT out of IT. I'm not trying to get more shadow IT either with the business trying to run its own tools. But those are all those things to try to figure out. So I think I'll just close and say having a fantastic relationship with IT is important and cybersecurity should support the goals of IT uh, in as much as possible. Obviously, if they're doing weird things, then that's a different topic. And we'll, we'll take additional questions outside and or at the happy hour. But you guys have been awesome. This has been great. Thank you so much. Three things.
guys for LobbyCon if you got questions for them, you can ask them there. And then if stick around, we've got a talk on careers and risk, which is a very hot spot to be.